Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your delighted host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. I'm I'm so happy that you're here because right now we're in a series that I am just loving and it's called For the Love of Untraditional Holiday Traditions. (laughs) I feel like I've perfected this the last two years. And so as we were sort of building out this series, I just said, we, we just have to go off the beaten path a little bit. Like there has to be a way to do the Christmas season that is nurturing and nourishing and isn't wearing us out and making us crazy and making us poor, right? Like what else is there? And so we started looking for new different types of guests. And so This particular episode, I hope, is going to prepare you for the pressure-induced haze of some of the holiday gatherings and all the parties and all the gift exchanges at work and just uh, the millions of dollars we feel like we have to spend on the perfect gifts and all the cooking and all the hosting and avoiding all these landmines with our relatives (laughs) It's tiring, right? Like, I don't want that. I don't. I don't want that. I don't want it for you. I don't want it for my kids. I don't even want, I don't want to set my kids up for that expectation. And they enter adulthood and go, oh, wow, this was really only fun when I didn't have to do any of it, right? This was really only fun when someone else did all the heavy lifting. I just think there's a better story. Um, And so I wonder if we can take a step back with our guest today, we're going to do this and ask ourselves, what, what parts of Christmas really matter to me? Like, what does it mean to my family? What, what has meaning? What do I want to mark and intentionally celebrate? What do I want to let go um, of? And so I've done a little of this in the last couple of years and ended up with a Christmas that felt really nurturing, even as the rest of life didn't. I just, I really do think there is a different way to do it that is connected and it's content. If you want it to be, it can be quieter. Uh, it can be a little simpler. Um, but here's the thing the, the I think the key phrases are here is if you want it to be, what, what do you want Christmas to look like? That's a big question we're asking today. I am here with a self-help author who wrote a book entirely on this very beautiful and possibly chaotic time of year. She even launched a two season podcast voted by Vanity Fair as the contemplative audio guide to get you through the holiday season. Um, She is really just phenomenal. I loved this conversation. We're here today with the very wonderful Beth Kempton. So Beth is a writer. She's a speaker, adventurer, seeker of the best parts of life. Beth has written five books and countless articles uh, for major publications all around the world. She's a nature lover, a fledgling gardener. She's a Reiki master trained in the Japanese tradition in Tokyo. She's a trained yoga teacher. She writes her own meditations and she's a wife and mom of two sweet girls. And then there's Christmas. Beth, as she will tell you, has been obsessed with Christmas since she was a little girl, which led to her writing her third book, which is called Calm Christmas and a Happy New Year, a little book of festive joy. So this book was designed to inspire just a new approach to Christmas where you create the kind of celebration you need this year and you take good care of yourself throughout the winter. So she has she's absolutely delightful. Oh, my goodness. Are you ever going to love her? You're going to love her English accent, which is where she hails from. And we are going to dive into her thoughts and her expertise on how to navigate this season in a way that is delightful and nurtures us and nourishes us and doesn't drain us. So please enjoy my lovely conversation with the wonderful Beth Kempton. Beth, 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 welcome to the For the Love podcast. Just absolutely so glad to have you here today. Thank you so much to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects in the world. What a treat. Thank you. And just, you look cozy, your wreath is cozy, your sweater is cozy. Like you are literally like staring into the curve. Oh, I see your cup. Yep. Yep. It's yep. a candle. I lit a, lit us a oh, winter a candle. candle. Yeah. And oh. I have my cozy cup here too, but oh. so much of, so much of Christmas is 
atmosphere, isn't it? And it's so much atmosphere. And I generally start it in October. And so we're going to get to this. Um, now, I have told my listeners a little bit about who you are, but I wonder if you would take just a minute and talk to us about who you are and where you are and who are your people and what is your deal? That's what is your deal, Beth? So I live in a small cozy stone cottage with a thatched roof in the southwest of England. Um, a wonderful place to spend Christmas indeed. Uh, I spend yes. a lot of the time out and about in tramping the fields and all of that, as well as mm. making home cozy as well. I am a writer. I am a mother. I'm, I know that you will have shared lots of things about me, but to be honest, the older I get, the the more I know myself and the less I know which are the right labels or even care about the Same. labels. <laughs> Same. You know, all, all of my work is about making the most of this precious life. For me to mm. do that in the work I do and also help other people do that. And sometimes it looks like books. Sometimes it looks like a podcast or courses or conversations. Um, but that's really what it is. For me, it's all a big what's the word it's like an excavation the, hmm. the whole of life and things just keep unfolding the things that we can't control yeah. and also the choices I make keep changing as my own life situation changes mm -hmm. um I think that this is a wonderful time of year to actually be thinking about that you know what what is it that who have I become this year who am I becoming it's phenomenal and I love your north star just making a meaningful life essentially and helping other people do it too what a wonderful um metric and we can just constantly apply that that is to me sort of the substance of a life well lived mm. and <laughs> I, I thought that we had a lot in common in terms of that. And then you said you start thinking about Christmas in October and well, we're kindred spirits. It's I only, <laughs> listen, I want this. This is how you're going to give this to me. And this is how you're <laughs> going to give me this pass. I've only done that the last two years and only because my life imploded. That's it. Like, um, and especially that first year in 2020, my life sort of unraveled in July. And so I was just, we were just hanging on by tattered threads, me and the kids. And so October came and I told my kids and I had never done this in my life. I mean, never, never, never. I said, guys, I mean, I do not know what else to do, but we are going to fill this house with some happiness and with some joy. And I don't know how we're going to do it, but I think we start by putting up a tree real early and let's start getting cozy. And they're like, mom, it's hot outside. I'm like, I know. And I don't care. And so this is a new thing that I'm doing. This was me saying, oh, life went really sideways. Is there any way I can grab the Christmas season by the tail a little early and extend its life in my household? So that's how I get a pass on that. That is so wonderful. And isn't it interesting that you turn to the symbols of Christmas, the tree, the lights, whatever, yeah. as comfort in a, in a really difficult time. And I know it's up to everyone when they put the tree up, but I'm totally the same. If it that brings you joy. Why not extend it as much as you can? I have to say that the October thing was is is when my husband's out and my children have gone to school. Yes. I have the Christmas songs on at home on my own. Yeah. Um, yes. In the house, it's November. But actually, when Calm Christmas first came out a, a while back, we did a photo shoot in September. So we went to the yeah. Christmas tree farm and it turned up and the lady was like, nobody comes here for another eight weeks. And we got her to cut down the trees for us. And we had a Christmas tree in our house, very similar, um, you know, for a good 12 mm -hmm. weeks before Christmas. And it was <laughs> cool, you know, just right. sit next to twinkling lights in the evening. It's just lovely. It's just lovely. And of course, it's um, for a lot of us reminiscent of um, years gone by and childhood and older, wonderful memories. And it really is. Um, it just carries its own weight. Um, these symbols and what they've meant to us, what they mean to us now. I, I love that you mentioned Calm Christmas. Of course, that's what we're talking a lot about that today. What I loved about your approach in that book was that sometimes around this time of year, I feel like we kind of get inundated with lists. Like here's all the things to do to make the magic. Like the, the pressure to make the magic is high. 
and it's it's add these to this tradition and this one and this one and and maybe you can start doing this and think about this and it's this is already potentially an overwhelming season and so the lists make me feel anxious and shut me down but your work in calm christmas it's more of a like a holistic inquisition into what does christmas mean to each of you readers like that's kind of can you talk a little bit on how your experience of how Christmas really does mean something different and slightly unique to everyone. And maybe it's possible to just let ourselves off the hook of being the sole proprietor of Christmas magic in our families, which as a, a lot of women feel that way about this time of year. Oh, yes. I call it the keepers of Christmas. Uh, and what and what's just so crazy is that we often work so hard to to do all the things to support the people we love in the ways that look like a tray of cookies and a beautifully decorated house and all that stuff. And I think an element of that is just gorgeous. It's a way of showing love. You'll know that cookbook author, you know, cooking yes. for your people is a really sure. big part of showing your love for sure. Sure, but I think because of the way we are surrounded by social media and advertising all the time and yeah. with Black Friday, it doesn't help. It's just a huge buildup of the commercial side of Christmas for mm -hmm. weeks. So when we're, we're talking about start Christmas early, that's not the commercial start Christmas early, listen to all that's those right. messages and get sucked in. This is create quiet and calm and coziness mm -hmm. in your home early. And I think there's just so much comes at us. Mm -hmm. that it, you have to be intentional if you don't want to get sucked into it. And it was so interesting. Um, I collect Christmas magazines um, and the ones I collected in the pandemic were, all, there were so many features on taking care of yourself and nourishing yourself mm -hmm. and all that because we'd had such a difficult year. And then the 2021 magazines were all back to create the perfect uh, Christmas, decorate this, bling that. And I was like, what happened? I'd been so hopeful that finally, mm -hmm. you know, that one of the silver linings of the pandemic had been to have a different approach to this time of year. And it wasn't at all. And I think the reason it's so important to, to think carefully about Christmas is because it's not just Christmas Day. It's the whole of winter. It's the season mm. that sets us up for the year that follows. Is the, the impact on our mental health can be enormous. So there's so many reasons beyond just Christmas. Um, mm. and, and when I was writing the book, what I was really conscious of was I've loved Christmas all my life. My oldest daughter was born on Christmas Day. And as soon as mm. that happened, I was like, well, of course she was. I love Christmas. And I'm not saying that Christmas has never been hard. And I'm sure we'll sure. talk about that. But just I am someone who loves Christmas. and I know that not everybody does. So I was mm. really keen to talk to lots of people and make sure this wasn't just me saying this is how Christmas yeah. should be. This was kind of understanding what lots of people's Christmases are like. So I actually talk to hundreds of people from all over the world with all sorts of different backgrounds, ask them lots of questions that it was so interesting. It mm. felt actually like a real honor. So many people shared very, very personal stories um, of, of this time. A lot of mm. them incredibly sad. Actually, I was amazed by how many difficult stories there were. And I'm sure we get onto that. But um, the thing that really stood out to me that was that there wasn't one single symbol of Christmas that everybody connected with. So not everybody puts up a tree, not everyone gives presents, yeah. not everyone eats turkey, you know, not, mm. not everyone even takes a day off. There were so many different things, but within the hundreds of responses that I had, um, there were these patterns that kept coming up and they basically evolved within the writing of the book into what I call the five stories of Christmas. And yes. every single person that I spoke to related to one or more mm. of these in a mm -hmm. really strong way and what I realized was actually it's a way for us to understand what means to us at Christmas and also what we can let go of because we don't mm. actually care about it and also a way to have really meaningful conversations with other people because the thing is when I say Christmas you have Jen's movie of Christmas running through your head That's right which is a combination of all the ones you've loved and all the ones that have been difficult and all the ones you wished you'd had and never did and all the hard mm. things have happened and all those things. That's your movie. My movie looks completely different. And yet we say, what should we do for Christmas? And we, we're seeing completely different things. Um, mm. So it's a way to talk to each other. And 
it doesn't mean that just because we have this conversation, we're going to suddenly realise we think exactly the same about Christmas because we probably don't. But it helps us help the other person have the Christmas that they want and need and helps us ask for the Christmas that we want and need and find compromise and and all of that. All right. Let's 100 percent talk about. <laughs> what you discovered are the five different stories of Christmas and, and what, what you found out, like how does naming our relationship to these stories help us ultimately kind of, like you said, sort out our intentions for this season, what we want to keep and what we can like let go without any guilt at all. Well, I think the first thing that it does is tells us that Christmas has not been the same thing through the centuries Christmas has evolved and it's Mm -hmm. different in different countries it's different in different families it's different for different people and it's different through time which Mm. means that we get an opportunity to be part of its evolution so we don't have to do everything just because we've always done it that way that's good first one is the story of faith which is Mm. the biblical story of Christmas which most people will be familiar with and the Uh question is how much is that part of your experience of Christmas and Mm. what matters to you at Christmas so one way to think of it is if that wasn't any part of your Christmas would you mind Mm. would you miss it and so that's the first one okay and it doesn't mean that you can only have one okay I I was brought up one way and have evolved other things as a grown-up so all permission given to to associate with whichever you like the second one is the story of magic so Mm. that is Father Christmas, Santa Claus, elves, flying reindeer, all yeah. of those stories. And it's so interesting that these five stories can coexist. That's right. I mean, it's just Even a kind of other. competing. <laughs> yes. yes. They're completely competing. Yes. And they're all kind of in the pot, right? Yes. Yeah. And then we have the story of the Victorian Christmas, the Dickensian mm. story, the story of connection. Really, it's about gathering. If you think of all the symbols of the Victorian Christmas, which is where many of the things that we think of as traditional Christmas things come from, so mm. like the Christmas tree and gathering to feast and all of that. And Dickens actually very much created yeah. our Christmas. And he wasn't writing down what was happening. A lot mm-hmm. of it is that he wrote it and it became what our Christmas is. So how much of in your Christmas, is that connection piece important? For some people, it's everything. For some people, they'd rather have nobody <laughs> around. Yeah. And maybe, and just one particular year, that's what they want. They don't want any people around. And then the next year, they want people around mm. again. So this is something to come back to every single year, you know, and, and think, where am I this year? Then okay. the fourth story is the story of abundance. So that mm. is presence and generosity and charity and Santa hats on the streets of, you know, people in Santa yeah. costumes on the streets of New York and, mm. and all of that. That's really important for some people, um, less important for others. It is all the commercial elements of, of Christmas, but not saying that in a way that that has to be bad. Um, sure. It's very much about generosity as mm-hmm. well. And then the last one is heritage. That's your own traditional, yeah. like family traditions. It might be your um, from your community. It might be based on where you are in the world. Your, the mm-hmm. climate where you live can have a huge impact on the way that you celebrate Christmas. So thinking sure. about those five things and saying, which is the most important to you? Which mm. would you really miss if you didn't have that aspect in your Christmas? I mm. wonder for, Jen, for you, Jen, which is... Mm. Uh, so interesting. Like you're saying each one and I'm going, Oh, yeah, I've got some of that and that <laughs> one. Oh, that too. It, it is interesting. You can, you can have elements of all of those really, even the ones that seem are, are seemingly in opposition. Um, do you have one that you, that rises up to the top for you more? I do right now. Cause I have two children, small children mm. and it's magic. Magic. It's, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, And you can combine them. So it might be that you, for example, your great aunt handed down a particular recipe and that's the main thing that you serve at your dinner because gathering is important to you. That's so true. I'm all, I definitely, in terms of a filter, which I use to decide, do I accept that invitation? Do I make that invitation? Do I spend money on that thing? Do I spend time on that thing? It's magic for me Mm. at the moment. I'm sure that will evolve. I remember that season. I remember that. So my, my youngest is 16. So oh. my kids are like 16 to 24. So magic is a little bit more in our rear view mirror. 
Um, but I remember when that was the driver. I mean, that is we we built sort of around that narrative and it had its own charm. Faith has always been a through line for me, which is hilarious that I could also have Santa, but somehow <laughs> I found a way, but always been a through line. I I felt like I felt like when you were saying that, um my I think that I would probably lift up as the lead story, probably abundance. I, I think, and I'm thinking holistically, like in terms of all of Christmas, like the whole kit and caboodle, not just the one day, the one day for sure it's gather. And, and my home's the gathering spot. So I've hosted Christmas morning with my entire extended family for as uh, 20 plus years. Um, and they're walking in the door by 7 30 AM. Like we don't mess around. We're like, 7 30 everybody be here like the kids are sitting in the living room like i'm gonna give them 30 more minutes you know and and it's a, so togetherness matters too but in the course of the season i spend a lot of time and energy thinking about good gifts thinking mm-hmm. about giving um that's a that's the time also when i'm thinking about giving to in my community too in a special way and um, in the world really and so, however, I could see some of all that. I've got some of my own traditions too. Um, but it, it's helpful for me to hear you say that because I can, I can go, oh, we can hold on to some and release them later. Like something that was pretty prevalent for me 10 years ago, is it now? Or something kind of takes the lead position back and forth. I love that story. Did you find in your interviews and in your research were there a couple that rose to the top just in terms of quantity of no 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 no, not at all that interesting it was and it was so interesting I did one uh, talk at a bookshop um when the book came out and this um lady brought her mother with her and she said that they have really stressful Christmases and Mm. they can't figure out why because they all just want to have a nice time and we went through this exercise in the talk and they they were just hugging each other and crying at the end going, now I understand why you've been trying to force Christmas this way and I've been mm. trying to force it this way and why it doesn't work. So it's really great to do it for yourself, but also really lovely conversation to have with someone else. And, and even if what it tells you is, well, faith really matters to you, doesn't matter so much to me. And the symbol, mm-hmm. you know, the thing that brings mm-hmm. the faith to, to life for you is the Christmas carol service, for example, Mm. like if you Mm -hmm. don't go to that, you feel like it hasn't been Christmas, Mm. then I can look at that and say either I am going to find the most beautiful, I'm going to take you to the Royal Albert Hall in Mm. London for a candlelit carol service this year because it means so much to you. That's my gift to you. Or it might be that I say, I really, I don't like a Christmas carol service. It brings Uh, up certain memories for me. It's not fair to you that I'm the one who comes, but I know that your friend Sarah absolutely Mm. adores Christmas carols. Why don't I take you both? I'll drop you off. You can go for a lovely drink at the bar first, go to the Mm. evening carol service and I'll come pick you up. I like home. this. You, that you, yeah. can, you can find ways. It doesn't mean it forces everything together, but it helps you understand what matters to somebody else as well yeah. as knowing what, what you want to fit in and, and leave out. And actually leaving out stuff is probably the most important thing for a calm Christmas. <laughs> no, I love definitely. this because so much of our interpersonal conflict just comes by unmet expectations. And so if we don't know what someone's expectations are around Christmas or if they're different than ours and we assume we're all a carbon copy of what matters, it's just fertile soil for disagreement or like disunity, but there's a way through that. And this is like a really good guide. Stories are just everything, aren't they? My whole entire Feed These People cookbook is packed with entertaining stories behind the recipes, most about my family. I loved compiling and remembering all those moments. So this holiday season, I wanna tell you about this really cool gift that's all about story, and it's called StoryWorth. StoryWorth is an online service that helps you and any of your loved ones preserve precious memories and stories for years to come. It's really special and unique. Every week, StoryWorth emails your family or friends a thought-provoking question of your choice from this huge pool of possible options. 
Every unique prompt asks questions you maybe never thought to ask, like, what's the bravest thing you've ever done in your life? After a year, StoryWorth compiles all those questions and stories, including photos, into a beautiful book the whole family can share for generations. It is so special. I am obsessed with StoryWorth. It's such a thoughtful and meaningful gift and connects you to the people that matter most to you. And it's super good for those family members and friends who are like family. I have a story worth going for my ride or die besties and also for my fam, my kids and sibs and parents. Um, You would be surprised what we've discovered about each other or the things we remembered that we'd forgotten. With StoryWorth, I'm giving those I love most a thoughtful, personal gift from the heart and preserving their memories and stories for years to come. So go to StoryWorth.com slash For the Love and save $10 on your first purchase. That's StoryWorth.com slash For the Love to save $10 on your first purchase. Let me ask you this, Beth, because while we're talking about potential conflict around the Christmas season, um, there is... God, who even knows how many people listening who kind of have like an instant memory of maybe even last Christmas for Pete's sake, where, you know, the family's around the table and you've been working and working, you know, Christmas generally falls disproportionately a little bit to the, to the mom in the household in terms of the Christmas labor and it's the cooking and it's the shopping and it's the wrapping and the planning and the, the million things. And then the family's gathered Somebody just has to say something hard at the table, something that is just going to be like a little grenade right in the middle of like this moment. And so that none of us want that. We all want to avoid that feeling in general. And so I'd like to hear your thoughts. I mean, talk about a calm Christmas. We want that. We don't want an argument around the table. We don't want to feel resentful or begrudgingly toward our family members. So can you talk just a little bit about what you see as helpful, useful, reasonable, practical, maybe boundaries? Um, How can we set ourselves up in advance? Like, let's not just hope this happens to us accidentally. How can we set us and our families up in advance to have a connected, calm Christmas? That was a really long question. Do your best with that. (laughs) I mean, what a fantastic question. You've really reached the nub of it already in the question. It doesn't, it's, it, you don't fix it at the table when the grenade is dropped and you probably know who's going to drop the grenade and what it's going to sound like because it's dropped most times that person's invited, right? That's right. It it begins so much in advance. And, And for me, It begins in a cafe or in an armchair in a quiet part of my house with a cup of tea. And the question, based on the year that you have just had, what do you, what kind of Christmas do you want and need this year? Oh, that's good. That question to yourself is the first, nothing to do with anybody else. Mm. That's the question for you. Oh, I love that. And to answer it with one word between a and Christmas, a something Christmas, a calm Christmas. It might mm. be a, a, a riotous, joyful Christmas mm. because of something that's happened. It might be a, you know, I don't know what, what it is that you fancy this year, mm-hmm. but it could be, you know, a magical Christmas if that's what you want. But a restful Christmas if you've had an exhausting year, mm. a meaningful Christmas if you've had a year of milestones or a year mm-hmm. of loss or, you know, whatever it is, just pick a word. You're, you can pick any word except the word perfect. That's uh. bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does not exist. No, no. Mm -hmm. And once you've done that, that can be the lens through which you look at the season and all the things on the table and all the things that you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And you it gives you a way to respond to requests and to prioritize because nobody can do everything that we'd like to do. And then depending on what you've you've decided, it might be that you question the very prospect of having that gathering you know you said you've hosted for 25 years maybe a year comes where you like I'd like a Christmas just me and one other person for example Mm -hmm. and if that is what you've decided is the most important kind of Christmas you know a solitary Christmas or whatever Mm -hmm. then the gathering doesn't even come into it and you'll find a way to you know pass that on to somebody else for a year or it might be that actually you do want to do that but you realize that you know calm is a really important thing for you at that meal and so you realize that you have to somehow avoid the explosion and that might Mm. be something as simple as 
the seating plan. It might be mm. having a lot less alcohol and sugar. It might be getting everyone to go on a long walk instead of sitting around in, in a hot house with 15 people all day long. It might be that normally you have three days of family and you decide we're going to have a lunch. And then, you know, the invitation says, come from 12 till three. And then the bell yes. rings at three and everyone gets given yes. a gift gift and they all go home there wasn't mm. enough time for the grenade to be dropped so that's that's a really important okay. thing up front I think but then obviously there's some years where it you you have to in terms of there is a you know a reason a duty or something not every year you never have to do every year but it might be that you have a much older family member who is this is probably going to be their last Christmas mm. and you decide my gift to them is to let them have exactly the Christmas that they want on that mm. day. And that includes them choosing who's coming. And if that includes the grenade dropper, then that's fine. And we'll get through okay. that. But you remind yourself that, you know, you've made the choice to do that. And so in that case, you probably want to put a little survival kit in your bathroom and write down the reason why you're doing this. You know, yes. you might have a little poetry book in there, read some poetry, escape from <laughs> over there, or, you know, eat some chocolate or whatever you want to do. Yeah. Them, aromatherapy and um, have a little uh, or step outside something you know that if it comes to that you can extract yourself from the situation or maybe you've got an ally you can talk to in advance saying I think this is going to happen if mm -hmm. this subject comes up can you please take the initiative to change the subject now get involved with I've done that mm -hmm. <laughs> there's, so, there's so many things we can do and I think if there's a long a long period where people are in your home especially if they're staying over it can be really nice to create a quiet little space where people including children can go to you know little coloring area or some bean bags with some headphones and music or anything so that people don't feel forced to sit and talk to each other all mm. the time because it's often not really a natural situation through the year we might right. gather but actually only speak for like 10 minutes because there's yeah. other things going on and then suddenly three days together with alcohol yeah. and sugar and you're going to get through all the easy conversation you're going to get to mm. those big topics so um being intentional I think makes a huge difference mm. fantastic I love this this feels really um comforting and possible that we can have some agency over the day, the season, um, the expectations. We're not just at the end of everyone else's rope that we get to have, you know, some autonomy over how we want that day to look and feel. So let's talk for um, just a minute about this whole sense of chaos. And I don't, I, I'm curious about your research I have a suspicion, and maybe I'm wrong. I have a suspicion that Americans are particularly chaotic around Christmas. <laughs> it feels crazy over here. And yeah. sometimes when we like peek into like the international windows of other countries, there's just a, it's just like a more sober minded, grounded sense of the season. But over here, it's manic. It is nonstop. It feels like it grows year after year after year. What's expected, what's possible. Then, of course, we have social media showing us every single possible bit of Christmas magic in the entire known universe. And we just start feeling like overwhelmed, this sense of chaos, yeah. um, too many moving parts, too many elements. So, Beth, give us some tips on um, setting those expectations correctly. And what does it really mean strategically to find calm in the midst of Christmas chaos, which is a choice. It's a choice, but it's hard to resist. Oh my goodness. It is. And I was just listening to you taking a deep breath because I yeah. can feel that yes. anxiety rising from the, you yeah. Everything that you're saying is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. I think it's America is the global leader in these things. So we I love so. to, do, you know, you make all those amazing movies that we all sit down and watch on repeat. And actually, like when my um, daughter was born on Christmas Day, we spent about two weeks all night long watching Hallmark movie after Hallmark movie. Totally. And they they're amazing. We love them, but there there is definitely an element of the commercialism which yeah. can be completely overwhelming and we've not even touched on the fact that Christmas sends so many people into debt and you know mm. this is 
this year, right. I think with the energy crisis, cost of living crisis, it's That's it's right. worse than ever for a lot of people. And yet the noise is getting louder. So the pressure to do it is is getting louder. So I think there's there's all sorts of chaos. There's the chaos of the dates, all the things we're supposed to squeeze in before Christmas and, you know, with, with two children at school and all the things they have to dress up as and the things we have to bake and all that stuff. I'm very, very aware of that before Christmas. Mm -hmm. And then there's the chaos of all the noise which just makes it difficult to to figure out what actually you want to do so you can get swept along with it. And before you know it, it's January and you've got a massive credit card bill and mm-hmm. you're getting yeah. all those things you bought. And so it is very much about the intention. But I think thinking my response to you talking was to breathe. Mm-hmm. And I think that's absolutely vital in terms mm-hmm. of preparing ourselves for all that is to come. We can, of course, switch off are we don't have to check social media we don't have to watch tv we don't have to engage in all those things we don't have to go to the shopping mall we do get sucked into it but those are things that we can do to create some you are right for sure but also breathing in terms of literally just stopping in the middle of anything and doing some focus breathing even yeah. when people are looking at you you can still breathe deeply without anyone realizing which is another thing to do at the table when the grenades mm-hmm. dropped but also all the things connected to breathing so making space to go to a yoga class to do yeah. some meditation to what one thing i love to do is block out some time in the first week of christmas which like december which always feels like an impossible ask to go on a writing retreat sometimes it's two days sometimes it's five Mm. days but it's become my way of going really calmly into Christmas because then it's a lot I have to get done before I go and then by the Mm -hmm. time I come back it's really festive and I'm delighted to be there you know and I haven't Mm. taken away from the most important time with my children or anything like that but finding ways to create space in your schedule as well so recovery time if you know you've got a really big gathering don't have another night out the next night and the next night you know put some downtime in yeah and make sure you're carving out space to do some journaling or to just meet with a friend and go for a walk with a coffee not always alcohol if you drink alcohol Mm -hmm. you know those kinds of things just taking care of yourself is so important because it isn't just that one day it's a long old stretch Mm -hmm. and the more we take in everything that oh it's Christmas so I'll just eat this or I'll just drink this and then totally and we don't sleep properly. And then come January, we're looking at that credit card bill with, you know, exhausted eyes and feeling overweight. And that's, you know, yeah. that's why all the gym, gym membership um, go up right. in January. So mm-hmm. all, all of that stuff, it's it's really simple, I think. But it all begins with just having a bit of a pause right about now and thinking about these things. And then for every event you plan in, planning in some quiet time those kinds of things so so breathing and space I think that's great I love it planning sounds simple but it is the difference between um charting your own course and then just sort of becoming swept up in the thing because most the average person is going to have um so many opportunities to fill their December calendar more than they more than they can more than they should, more than there's room for. And so the tail will wag the dog if we just decide, well, let's just see how it goes. Well, how that generally goes is chaotic. And so rather saying, these are my boundaries. These are my limits. I'm going to do one Christmas party and I'll pick and I will politely decline the others. And of course, nobody will die. Nobody (laughs) dies when we don't go to something. Um, I have discovered that I like a quieter Christmas in general. And I mean, season, I like a quieter December as opposed to tons of fancy dresses, tons of parties, tons of, um, secret Santas, tons of, there's just so much to do. I prefer it really quiet and, and small and cozy and close in. And so I've done that for the last couple of years. It's a huge difference. Um, the way I both enter and leave the season. Mm, love that. And it's it's interesting for anyone who posts on social media with a tiny following or, or a big following to be conscious about what you're posting. Are you feeding this perfection machine with uh, yeah. your messaging and your photographs? Or are you saying, here's me going for a walk uh-huh. and sitting by a tree with a cup yeah. of tea, enjoying the quiet side of uh-huh. December, whatever, you know, just being, being part of the conversation you want to be That's part good. of rather than feeding I like the other. that. 
I like that. Um, let me ask you this. And I, I would just, you've spent so much of your time and energy around Christmas and people's experiences of it. Obviously, you know, um, a lot of people, they kind of internally suffer around the Christmas season. It's just a reminder of what they never had or what they wish they had and don't, or there's loss around it that seems to be intensified around Christmas. And so Christmas for a lot of people can be lonely Mm -hmm. and it can be sort of an impetus for grief. And so how do you suggest that we honor the melancholy that Christmas can sometimes bring without letting it take us under the waves? It's so important to talk about it. I think that's that's the number one thing, just to talk about it. When you talk, when you were saying just before about all the party invitations and everything, I'm listening to that saying, if if that is you, that is a fantastic approach. And I've got also, some friends like that who want to yeah. be at every party and that's happy yeah. for them. They yeah. like that. So yeah. yes. But also I've experienced Christmases where I've had no invitations because I've moved mm. to a new city yep. and I don't know anyone and I'm totally. really lonely and every you know, shop window where there's people buying presents and every restaurant where you can see people having a lovely time is a reminder of how lonely I was. And it's incredibly Mm -hmm. difficult. Um, And one of the things that I was, I don't know why, but was really shocked by was how many people that I spoke to, I I would say more than 80% had a a very sad story connected with Christmas in some way, yeah. whether that was eighty percent. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, something like that. Just so many. Yeah. And we think, you know, the the empty chair at the table is a very obvious one. The person who's always shared Christmas with us and isn't there mm-hmm. this year, or maybe passed away a few years ago but it's Christmas that's the time that that really comes to the surface and it's you know that's a really big part of it for us it doesn't go just after the first Christmas after after they've gone so there is absolutely that kind of grief and I I think that was huge especially in the Mm. pandemic Um, not just because so many people were lost in that year but also because people realized they were grieving other things the things that didn't happen that they'd hoped for the weddings that didn't happen the graduations that didn't happen the jobs that were lost and all of those things but for me one of the the most the, the stories I just couldn't forget were the ones of the people who desperately want children and can't have them and Mm. have to keep going to their family Christmases where everybody is just making it all about the children and it's incredibly difficult for them to be there and nobody asks them about it nobody considers that it might be hard for them they feel like they have to go and Mm. they have to hold their emotions in all day long and have a terrible Christmas and are at a time that they could be getting you know, support and love from their family, it's become a really, really difficult time for them. So there were a lot of those stories as well. And so I think the the thing to do is think, is remember that everybody's got something going on. And to be honest, everybody is grieving something or sad about something or feeling lonely at this time of year. It might not necessarily be on Christmas day it might not be the day that you meet up with them but during the winter season which also from a mental health point of view is very difficult for a lot of people kind of compounds the problems right so I think the number one thing is to talk about it to to have that conversation with yourself about what you want and need like we said what do you need from Christmas this year and then ask for it from people say to people Mm. you know I've had a really hard year I probably am not going to be Mrs Jolly Christmas this year and it's not personal and I'd love Mm. to come but I don't know if I'll feel up for it so can we stay with a maybe for now and I'll let you know or can can we send each other something in the post instead because I don't think I'll be able to face people or you know what what it you'll know for your Mm. people what it is that you can talk to them about but just the awareness of the kind of year that friends have had um Mm. makes I think make a huge difference how how about you I know that you've had a very different Christmas for Mm -hmm. the last few Christmases Mm -hmm. and I mean did you try and show up the same Mm -mm. did you go completely Mm -mm. in the opposite direction did you Mm -hmm. talk to people how did it go um the first year I think I and I, I kind of did it on purpose, but I overcorrected. As mentioned, I was like, it's October, it's tree time. Um, I'll turn the air conditioning up and we'll put on a sweatshirt. And I just was so starving for something good. I was so starved for 
us to laugh and have a happy moment in this sad house Mm -hmm. that I was just like, uh, literally, we're going to go over the top here. And so that was the first year. Now, last year, <laughs> last year, which was, we had a kind of a year under our belt of recovery. And, um, and so my kids are older, like a, they're, a, they're, most of them are launched. And so I was getting ready for Christmas, still wanting it to be early. And I was trying to get every one of our traditions is the decorating of the tree. I know that's not special, but is huge in our family. Like we, we have all like a, we have an ornament from every year. Every person does. And they're all just so every special. year. Oh. We look at them like we've never seen them before every year. We're like, remember this one? I mean, it just never runs out of magic, but, um, I could not get my adult kids and my college kids wrangled to all be here. I mean, I tried every group text. I tried calling. I tried emailing week. I could not figure out the, the way to get everybody here on one day where one of them wasn't like, you can't do it if I can't be there. And I finally went, Oh, guess what people for the first time in all y'all's lives. And certainly in mine, I'm not doing this anymore. I've tried Y'all can't come. I'm not going to leave one or two of you out. And so I like, boop, 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 internet. I need to find a company that can come and decorate my house for Christmas. And so I just handed over my credit card and a whole little team came in. They brought a tree, all these fancy decorations. And we don't have fancy decorations. We have family decorations. They're trashy. And so it was all like color coded. I've never had this in my entire life. Um, They did the mantle. And they left. And then the day after Christmas, they came back, they took it all down, they cleaned it and they took it. And it might've been the best thing of my entire life. (laughs) So I just said, tradition has always been big, big, big here in this particular way, but it's not working this year. And I want to have happiness and I live here. So I'm going to buy my Christmas tree and I'm going to pay somebody to make it pretty. So now I know you can still have like a great Christmas, even as you change out some of your like priorities, which I did. And I might do it again this year because it was really nice. (laughs) So brave that is amazing and if you can do it just shows doesn't it like there might be some difficult conversations but it's your Christmas too I think that's That's where we forget it is your Christmas too and sometimes you have a really hard year and you just need to that's right. Hold on to Christmas as this light at the end of the tunnel, right? I love that's that you right. Do that. that's And we didn't lose anything. We still were together and we still had our movies and we still had all the other like beautiful parts. It wasn't like a, we didn't lose Christmas. It was just this one thing was causing me anxiety. It was making me mad at all my kids. <laughs> and I'm just like, wait a minute. Wait, could I do this differently? I can. So, um, so the question for you is this year, are you going to have the perfectly color coordinated tree with the old decorations on it? Or are you going to have right? the joy of two years later, bring huh? them out of the box, which are you going to uh-huh. do? Well, they took all the pretty decorations with them. It was essentially like I rented a pretty Christmas. They brought it in and they brought it all back out. So all I have is family Christmas ornaments, but I'm just telling you, there was something about just walking in the door and my whole living room was beautiful and it looked like a grown up Christmas, which I've never had. And I'm like, and at this point this year, I'm the only one who lives in my house. Four of my kids are launched and my my youngest is a foreign exchange student in Spain this whole year. So I'm like, wait a minute, this is literally my Christmas. Like I'm the only one in this house. And so what do I want? I'm going to ask after this episode, I'm telling you, I'm going to sit down and think, I want a what Christmas? Please tell me (laughs) after Christmas how it was. And I think you've just written a giant permission slip there to anybody who stresses Mm -hmm. over Christmas food, for example, buy it in. Buy it frozen and warm it up in the oven. Put some cheese on top and or sugar on top or whatever. Or you know, if you've got the means, get somebody to make it for you and bring it in. Or ask all the people to bring something. You don't totally being the keeper of Christmas. I think is the one who remembers that Christmas matters. It doesn't Mm. mean the one who has to do everything, and that's that's certainly not the way it's always been done. That is amazing. I love that council. It's that time of year again, how in the world, but we're staring the holidays right in the face. If you've been following along for a while, you know that every year I share some of my favorite things for the holidays that I'm buying for my own friends and family from incredible companies that give back from brands that are women owned 
to social enterprises doing so much good in the world. And let me tell you this, if you've shopped my gift guide before, you have made a difference. Because you've shopped, you've changed lives. I continue to hear beautiful stories from so many of the businesses. These companies are able to survive and thrive and expand because of your support, this community's support. That's why I'm super excited and delighted to bring you my favorite things gift guide this year, but we're doing it a little differently. I'm focusing on just six companies that I love. People's lives have absolutely been changed because of you shopping from the gift guide in years past, and we're gonna keep that going. Included in the mix are our good friends at Thistle Farms. We put together a renew and revive gift set that is a fantastic gift for literally anyone, and of course their candles. You're gonna love Treehouse and Company's Holiday Spice Box. That's inspired by my cookbook and includes gourmet salt and pepper, Texas taco seasonings, um, fierce spice, so cute, and more. Over at Wagon Company, my Caffeinate These People pack includes fierce, free, and fire blends with tasting notes of like chocolate and dried cherry and praline. It's good stuff. Like I almost don't want to put my fake creamer in it. I curated a whole bunch of fun gifty gifts from Aspen Lane for you to shop, including dish towels with the best quotes. Just really good stuff for anybody on your list. And our go-to for all things style is of course Able. Handbags and apparel and jewelry and more. A hint, this is a good gift to give yourself too. Dun, dun, dun. Finally, we wrap it up with Hun's Honey, which is this incredible company. You're going to love them. They have the best hot honey and also amazing honey-based bath and skincare products. And of course, when you use my code for the love, you save tons of money when you shop. So show these rock stars some love and shop all the goodness over at jenhatmaker.com slash gift guide. These businesses make a huge difference and so can you. Let me ask you this before we wrap it up here. Now you may have none, but just in case you do, have you ever had like a huge Christmas d- catastrophe or disaster or a huge fail? Um, Cause we all have, of course, something has gone really, really sideways. So have you ever had a story like that, that now is like, of course, in our family, when this goes wrong, it lives on in Christmas memory forever. Like we'll tell the story for the rest of our lives. Do you have any of these? <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> what do you have? What do you have? Help us feel better. Okay. So, so my daughter was born on Christmas day, right? So after three days of labor, so we ate pizza. Fine. No problem there. Um, the next year was her first birthday as well as her first Christmas. Yes. So everybody just went insane with presents uh-huh. and we spent the entire day unwrapping presents and it was actually quite painful to see, uh-huh. you know, the waste and I was like she's one totally she's got she's no one. idea she doesn't That's eat right. this stuff yeah but it it actually started a really interesting conversation with um with our relatives and friends saying please don't buy our children plastic single-use plastic anything oh, yeah. and they never have since which has been oh. brilliant yeah but yeah. it was you know so that was that felt like a bit overwhelming but actually quite useful then the following year because I felt really guilty about basically telling my friends and family what they could <laughs> and couldn't buy my children and uh-huh. um, we decided to host my whole family which we'd never done because okay. of previous birth mm-hmm. and, and things like that and so everybody came around and we were absolutely determined that we were going to do everything and give them a lovely restful Christmas Okay. Bearing in mind, I'd had a second child by this point, who mm. was six months old. Oh gosh, feeding and a the, two-year-old mm-hmm. and a two-year-old. Yes. Mm-hmm. So my husband spent the entire day from breakfast through till dinner in the kitchen. Oh. We hardly saw each other. I spent the whole day looking after toddler and uh-huh. baby. Yeah. We missed most of the presents. Our yep. toddler was opening because we were running off doing stuff, and my family had a really nice time. I bet they did. <laughs> when they left, I was like, my family's really nice. We must have really insisted that nobody helped us for everyone to be sitting around. But it was so <laughs> funny. They all left and the children were asleep. Mm. And me and my husband just looked at the oh, terrible chaos. Chaos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The disaster of our house, stuff everywhere, paper everywhere. And we just totally flopped on the sofa with yeah. a glass of wine. And we both looked at each other. We said, we are never doing that totally. again that was the worst Christmas of our life and then we both looked at each other and went 
I don't even like turkey. And we realized <laughs> totally. that we've been eating turkey every year for Christmas and neither of us liked turkey. I mean, that's okay. just so ridiculous. It shows mm-hmm. the conversations you don't have. And so what felt like, don't, just for someone who loves Christmas, I felt like I had lost an entire Christmas. Like mm. one of only, if I'm lucky, a hundred Christmases in my life had just gone yeah. to the trash because of that. But after that, we've never had turkey since. And we make a Christmas, um, Chris, flavors of Christmas pie on Christmas Eve with not turkey. And then it's all ready. And we just put it in the oven the next day. We go to the beach on Christmas Day. And come back and eat oh. our pie and it's so oh much i love it we don't even do a christmas roast dinner we just have a pie and then whatever everyone wants to eat so oh the, the, that is so wonderful it worked out it, or they always work out even if all they become is a funny that's memory right. and they i think that's what out. we have to remember yeah uh-huh. even in the middle of it it's like it will be okay uh-huh. it's just it's, uh-huh. it's christmas that's exactly right and Breathe. Yes, everybody <laughs> breathe. I did that with my um, family years ago when I told you I hosted because I had um, the only kids in the family. And so, um, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of times Chris, family Christmases are centered around the glittles and I had the only littles. And so I remember and, and I would so it would just be kitchen all day long, yeah. all day. And that's not even fun. That is not even, and I love to cook. I wrote a cookbook. I don't want to be in the kitchen all day. On So I remember us sitting around one night and having just, uh, the women had just done it all, like all the cooking, all the cleaning. We were so worn out and mad. And so we were like, oh, what can we do differently? So probably easily 15 years ago, maybe more. We said, oh, that's it. That's it. Here's what we're doing on Christmas for Christmas dinner every year. And we have not deviated one time ever since. So we are going to have, we're going to have steak. Like steak's the like easiest thing in the whole world. Steak. <laughs> yeah, two minute steak. We're gonna have steak. We're gonna have baked potatoes. We're gonna have one vegetable and bread. Bought bread, like rolls that you just pop in the oven, and baked potatoes that just pop. There's literally almost no cooking to any of that. It is like fake food. It's fake dinner, <laughs> and it takes no that time. Tastes amazing. Tastes amazing. We kind of look forward to it now. Like we buy really good steaks. Like, well, at least they're delicious steaks. A baked potato. How, what, this isn't even, this isn't even, this isn't even cooking. So uh, that we went from here to here on like stress and food prep and cleanup and all of it. And it's just so fun. Like. So awesome. Why do we think, like, who do we think actually said anyway, we have to do it this way. Like we all think somebody did, but nobody did. Nobody did. And And what happened when you did that? Everyone just ate the steak and said. Thank you very much. We were like, delicious. steak, how special. <laughs> like we were thrilled. Everybody was thrilled. And so I do think that we have the, the opportunity to reimagine um, the elements of Christmas and the ones really pay attention to the ones that give us so much joy and connectedness and the ones that don't and make changes. Like, Absolutely. as you said, there's five stories of Christmas. Nobody does it all the same way. Nobody loves them all the same way. Like, there's just a lot of room here to create a season in a way that serves our families and our souls and our bodies and just kind of the whole, it can be a gift. It can be a gift if we choose to let it be. It really can. And a gift to ourselves as well as to others. Let's not forget that. It's really, That's really exactly important. right. Okay. Here's the very last question for you, Beth. And I ask all my guests this every series. And so I please answer this however you want. We get earnest answers. We get silly answers. We love them all. So you just do it however you want to do it. Uh, I borrowed this question from um, another author named Barbara Brown Taylor. And it says, what is saving your life right now? What a beautiful question. Mm -hmm. Amazing question. Writing. Oh. writing yeah mm-hmm. I I love writing in the mm-hmm. winter and the time between Christmas and New Year which I call the hush is such a beautiful time to write I start nearly all my books at that time of year yeah. but also in the middle of the chaos it's another way of creating space it's like a breath on the page it, it you know you might be noticing what you're seeing or writing about something else but absolutely writing is mm-hmm. is medicine I think mm, you know I believe the same exact thing so calming it's so centering where do you write do you have your own little space right here so uh-huh. this is a very old house so it has two staircases and this is the back staircase yeah and I'm basically under the staircase I love it it's 
smallest room in the house um but it's super cozy and it's next to the kitchen so it's warm mm-hmm. um I, yeah and I have this big old um desk that used to be in a science lab so mm-hmm. it's huge um it's basically just the desk that's what I thought I love my, this love it and you just I kind of to- tucked in there yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. But I, I really wanted to say to you, Jen, I was listening to you talking. I, I listened to your um your Christmas, your reflection at from mm. the end of last year. It was so yeah. lovely. And uh, it's so nice actually for all of us to just do that into a phone or mm. something, you know, because every year is different. But you were talking about how um you your book Fierce, you didn't want to read it again because you you were worried that it didn't it wasn't you on the page Mm -hmm. and then you read it and it was like oh yeah there I am and the wisdom that you needed was in those words and I think when we find the quiet it's so much easier to connect with the wisdom that we already Mm -hmm. hold and often don't even realize I think somehow our heart is way ahead of our mind in terms of what we know, what we need to know. And, and it's not just in writing books, just writing in a journal. Often we'll write something, especially if we, you know, we've used ritual and we're in a kind of quiet space with a candle in the darkness or whatever it is. And, and we just get really quiet and we maybe read a poem and then let the words spill out. Often we will release the wisdom that we need at that time mm. without even realizing it. And I think it's a really beautiful thing to do at this time of year because then next year you can look back and see what your heart already knew last year that you probably need this year it's like we're laying these crumbs for ourselves in advance Mm. when we put words on the page at this time of year I think Mm. oh what a lovely thing to say thank you thank you for remembering that back to me I had forgotten that I said that last year. Um, and you're so right. Um, we have a lot inside of us and the practice of getting still and quiet and just putting it down on paper. Um, one of my favorite, um, writers, his name was Henry now, and he said something like, I'm going to get his quote just a little wrong, but it was like, I do not know yet what's in my heart, but I trust I will find it as I write. And I have always found that to be true, that the practice of just beginning the writing process, I find out what's already in there. So thank you for that reminder. That is available to all of us. You don't have to be a writer to do that. Um, You just have to be a human um, who's willing to reflect and think and go quiet and go interior. And so, okay, Beth, yes, I love you. Will you tell everybody like where to find you, um, where to find your incredible work? where to follow you, all of that. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, what a treat this has been. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Beth Kempton. Um, when I'm busy working on a book, I'm on there a lot less, which is my commitment to my writing, but I am on there very often. And through uh, in the run-up to Christmas, I post a lot um, from a self-care point of view to support people. Um, I'm at dowhatyoulovefourlife.com. I have just released a new writing book called The Way of the Fearless Writer. And that is, um, I'm actually a Japanologist by training and it's kind of 2000 years of um eastern wisdom combined with my 25 year love affair with japan and my own experience of writing five books in five years nothing on you jen but (laughs) still quite a lot for me with little children you know i can't even five in five (laughs) years i can't believe you did it oh my goodness a lot of that is thanks to kind of radically gentle approach to creative living really and that's all in that book and and I'm very excited to be working on a new one that's out next year which involves lots of travel to Japan which is it's interesting the very one of the very first things you said in this interview was about um a life well lived and actually my next book is called kokoro which is a Japanese word for kind of heart mind spirit like the intelligent heart and the subtitle is Japanese wisdom for a life well lived and it's really yeah, I'm do, I, I just about hit statistically the midpoint in my life. Mm-hmm. And it's really kind of a reflection on the first half and looking ahead to perhaps the second half, who knows, but asking those questions instead of having a midlife crisis, having a midlife pilgrimage to explore, like, what do mm-hmm. I need to do now? What decisions do I need to be making now so that when I get to the end, whenever that is, knowing it will come at some point, um, to be able to go, yeah, I I lived my life well. I made the most of it. So I'm very excited mm. about 
Oh, how wonderful. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much for your time today. I'm so happy to have met you. Um, oh. And you are just welcome back in my world and my space. Absolutely. Anytime. Let's talk about it when your next book comes out. Let's reconnect. I would love to. Thank you so much. What a joy. And thank you for blazing the trail with your decisions about Christmas. That's good. I know. (laughs) I hope listeners will let you know what that gave them permission to do. That's perfect. Thank you, Beth. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay. Isn't that lovely? Doesn't that make you exhale? That made me exhale that whole conversation. I'm not kidding that I'm going to sit down and say to myself, I want blank Christmas a blank Christmas. I'm thinking about it right now. I am going to set intentions. Um, even if, so some of those are probably going to be inside our normal Christmas traditions and some are for sure going to be outside. And so anyway, I hope you love that. If you go to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, I will have this whole episode. I'll have the the show notes, and then I'll link to all of Beth's stuff because she's really got this whole canon of fantastic work to help us just live in just an intentional, lovely life. I really like her. I really like her way of being in the world too. So happy to introduce you to her if you didn't already know her. I'll also have all of her socials over there so you can follow her. Um, Thanks for tuning in this season. I know this is a busy time. It is. You've got a lot to do. I hope maybe you're listening to podcasts while you drive around, while you run errands, maybe while you shop, maybe while you're decorating, maybe while you're cooking, whatever it is that you're doing. If our little show is getting to keep you company, I'd love that. And so Amanda and I and Laura and her team just thank you and we love you and we love serving you every single year and definitely during this season. So everybody, Merry Christmas. See you next week.